Well, good morning. And as you can see, I am not Pastor Rick. He and Miss Joy are out visiting family and actually on their way back. They'll be back next week and we'll be able to hear from them. But this morning I have the privilege to be able to share with you and I am excited uh, for this morning. But I have some bad news. We're halfway through, almost halfway through November already. It is moving right along. And as a good Iowan, a good Midwesterner here, uh, there's something that we end up doing in the fall season. Most of us do at some point or another in our lives. And it's one of these here, uh, the good old corn maze, four acres of fun and frustration. And at first I was a little bit frustrated because I thought that was, fair, that was false advertising uh, because I just assumed that fun and frustration was like 50-50. And it's much more, at least for me, it's much more like about two minutes and 15 seconds of fun. And then that was just long enough for me to not know how to get back out. And the rest of it was nothing but frustration. But that, isn't that so how they go? You sit there and you're like, okay, I wanna... You, you get this awesome aerial map of this photo that just looks so cool, usually patriotic or something along those lines. Like, I have to go do this. And then it really is two minutes and 15 seconds. And we're just like, what have we decided to do here? And if you think about it, like if I were to invite you to come with me, let's go out to a field in the middle of Iowa and go walk around for an hour. You would look at me and say, you're insane. Like you really need to get a hobby, Brandon. This is wild. And I was thinking about this though. Like as you spend time in the corn maze, it starts the energy of the fun that was originally anticipated starts coming down really, really quickly. All of a sudden, I, f I find myself thinking so much about, man, I didn't think staring at a wall of corn would be this boring this quickly. And you start wondering, well, am I going to get stuck in here? How, is this, how does this work if we do get stuck? Are they going to send a team out for us? What is their process in all of these things? And so that's where I end up running into. And, and, and I was thinking about how much more it also kind of resembled, well, other things that we run into in life where we start to experience adversity. We may start to experience a trial in our life and the thoughts start adding up real, real quickly. For me, when I'm in that corn maze, it usually starts where um, I would like to know the name of the guy who took the picture of this field because this was not the field he took a picture of. It was some other field somewhere that looks great. And also I would like to speak to the manager of the person who came and cut this path in there because if this is what they were supposed to follow, they didn't do that either. And then I start to wonder like, who is the person that's navigating this group that I'm in right now? Who has the map? I'm gonna get the map. We're gonna figure out where we're at. We're gonna get out of here as soon as we can. And it just starts to go downhill from there. I start to wonder, uh, do they send a drone out or do they actually have a team of people that come and find you in this corn if you get left there? And then I, I really start worrying. I wish I would have paid more attention to those Bear Grylls survival shows at this point, because this is just all adding up super, super quick. But as I think about those trials and how they escalate through, uh, how my thoughts escalate through these different trials, I started thinking about that. And, and even with many of you guys, as I've walked with some of you through different adversities, there's a lot of resemblances. There were some parallels that I saw even with scripture, even in our Christian walk, because we have the aerial map. We call it the Bible. And it looks great and it sounds great. And I could be convinced that this is real and that we need to do these things. But man, down here on the ground, things are looking different. It doesn't look like that. I see a wall after wall after wall coming up. I don't know where I'm going. I'm confused, I'm discouraged. And I find myself in the midst of unknowns. I find myself in the midst of these trials and can't figure out how to make my current context match the aerial map, match the view here. How does this aerial map, how does the Bible apply to the situation that I'm in today? And so that's what I wanna talk about here a little bit this morning. I want to look at a Psalm, Psalm 77 is what we're gonna be looking at this morning. It's written by a guy named Asaph who 
We don't know a lot about Asaph, um, but I think we're going to find in his story, we're going to see that he's someone that we can relate to really, really well. Um, he's a really real dude, like all of us are, um, in that he just says things the way they are, and he says things in a way that I think we'll find that we can relate to. So we're going to start in Psalm chapter number 70 and verse number one and two, right on the top. And it says, I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord at night. I stretched out untiring hands and I would not be comforted. So Asaph, we don't know what this trial is. We don't know what the distress is that he's going through. And I find it pretty cool because if I did, I would compare myself to it. I would say, oh man, he's going through something so worse, so much worse than anything that I've ever gone through. And his faith is so big and he's writing these powerful things and I'm never, ever gonna get there. Or maybe I'll swing the pendulum the other way and I'll say, man, Asaph needs to get over it. Like he wouldn't last a day in 2023. Like this dude is crazy, what's going on? But we don't get to know that. What we do get to see is that he's experiencing a trial. He's experiencing adversity that's keeping him up at night. I've experienced that before whether I'm being kept up at night because of the circumstances that I'm going through, whether I'm kept up at night because of, I'm just praying and, and asking God to intervene in this situation and in this circumstance, whatever the case is, I can relate to being kept up at night. I can, be re, I can relate to calling out to God and not feeling comfort, not feeling heard, maybe even feeling alone. And that's where Asaph ends up going in the next eight or nine verses. He goes on and on and he starts asking questions that we kind of reserve for the counselor's office. He starts making statements that aren't ones that you share on a hot mic and with the world online and everywhere else. Things like he's too troubled to even speak. That's getting pretty angry, right? That's frustrated, that's sad. He goes further and says, will the Lord reject me forever? He says, will I ever see his favor again? Has his promises been taken away from me? One of the ones that hurts the most is he says, has God removed his compassion from me? God, who says, I'm love. He's in a spot. He's in a spot that most of us have found ourselves in or may even be in today where we can't even feel the love of God. While he calls us his creation, this masterpiece, we still find ourselves in this spot. Have you removed your compassion from me? I love that honesty. I love that transparency as he does that. And we run into these situations. It's just like the corn maze when you're walking and you take that turn and all of a sudden there is a wall of corn where there shouldn't be a wall of corn, at least according to the map, so you thought. But you and I always ex all experience this. You're walking along, you take a corner and you get a bad report from the hospital and you're stopped right in your tracks, right in the midst of the dark, right in the midst of the confusing. You're walking along and you take a turn and you've lost your job. Your relationships with your kids, your kids' relationships with your parents, your relationship with your parents, your friends, coworkers, all of the circles that you go through in your life, you find yourself at that wall. You find yourself wondering what's next, not feeling God being close in any way, shape, or form. These are the big questions that Asaph is asking. These are the big feelings and the big emotions that he has. And so I wanna tell you, these statements, these feelings, these emotions, they're heavy hitters. They're kind of taboo in church. And God makes space for you to cry out to him with that. God makes space for you to feel that anger, that sadness, the frustration, all of the things that happen in that adversity. He wants to hear from his kids. He wants to hear from you. Now, at the same time, we need to hold two things that are true. Our feelings and our emotions are extremely important. And at the same time, our feelings and our emotions are information that's telling us what's going on in here and what's going on in here. And those feelings and those emotions, they're things that 
probably shouldn't be navigating the course of our life. And they inform the direction and the decisions that we make in the course of our life. And so I wanna encourage you guys this morning in this part of the sermon to feel those things, to take time and sit in that space. I don't know where you're at this morning. Maybe you find yourself at the top of the mountain and I'm so glad that you are. I thank God that you are. And maybe you find yourself in the midst of adversity that you have never experienced before, a hardness that you don't even have a context for. I wanna end this first section of sitting in that space. I'm generally an optimistic person, so this is uncomfortable for me <laughs> to, to do that. But as we go into songs, as we go into celebrating baptism, I wanna leave us here at the edge of this cliff, the edge of this precipice. I'm, we're gonna end with hope, but spend some time crying out to God. Spend some time feeling his nearness, feeling that he does hear you. And then we'll come back and offer some hope. God, thank you so much. We left our buddy Asaph in a really bad spot. So I want to end with offering some hope in this passage. Um, hope that I hope can, uh, that I believe will meet you right where you're at, whether you find yourself in a good spot or uh, one of these spots of adversity. So we're gonna pick up in verse, verse number 11 of chapter 77. And in this, this is the part of this, of this chapter where he makes a turn. We've had all of these dark questions, these hard things that are going on. And he makes this amazing turn here. He says, but when I will remember the deeds of the Lord, yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I'll consider your works and meditate on all of your mighty deeds. So here's Asaph. He's in the middle of whatever this trial is that he's going through. And he stops and he takes a great big breath and he stops and he remembers what God's done in his life, where God has been present in his life. And that remembering becomes something that uh, happens consistently, constantly even, as it says that he's considering them. It says that, that he meditates on them. And so for us, I think that's where I want us to even be encouraged this morning. And what can we do? What can you and I do in the midst of these adversities, when you've hit wall after wall after wall, where do we find ourselves? Can we take a break? Can we take a breath and remember? This is the hard part because I resonate with the first part a lot better. That's my instant reaction. That's where I wanna go to. I start going down all these thoughts and these things and I look at all my circumstances and I don't take that breath. I don't slow down and remember where God has been. But I wanna encourage you guys to do that as I am working on doing that myself. Um, it looks like a lot of different ways. Uh, it can look like remembering by yourself, um, remembering on your own. A way that would be, an, a way that a lot of people do that is through a journal. As you're writing what's going on in your day, a challenge that someone's given you, you can journal these things out and you can be reminded of ways that God has shown up in the past. Or maybe it happens on your commute to work. Or if you're like me, it usually happens in the shower in the morning. I just, for whatever reason, I'm clicking at that time. Uh, you just have these times to be able to stop and to remember. Nothing's gone wrong on my day yet. I can start by just recalibrating and remembering where God was yesterday, a week ago, a month ago. But that's not all. We can remember in a corporate way. We're kind of doing that right here in our church. You can remember through maybe something that's said on stage, a line in a song, or maybe a whole song, the conversations that you guys have before and after services with each other. You can do that in groups, in your city groups, in your communities, in the groups that you guys have in your neighborhoods, at your workplaces, at your schools. We have so many different ways that we can remember. And in the midst of these adversities, in the midst of the times when it feels like God's abandoned us, this is a way that we can anchor ourselves back to him, back to something that is consistent, back to something that is true when our circumstances aren't reflecting that. So first we need to remember. And it's also important because God commands us to remember. He commands his people to remember all throughout scripture. 
we're, next week, we're going to have communion. That's a way, that is a command that we have to slow down and remember. So if you guys don't practice it this week, come back next week and let's practice it together. It'll be awesome. But he commanded, he's commanded these, made these commandments all throughout scripture. And uh, I want to highlight one of those for us. It goes all the way back to Exodus. And where, where this ends up happening is uh, the people of Israel, they're in Exodus. Um, they are s- slaves. They're being persecuted. They're being oppressed. Uh, it's a really bad situation. God's called Moses to come lead them out of this oppression. Um, but Pharaoh just keeps getting a harder and harder heart. Um, And so they end up going through these 10 plagues. And where we find ourselves in this chapter is we're right at plague number nine, fixing to be plague number 10. And God comes down or, or speaks to Moses and Aaron and talks to them about what he wants done with this. He says, I want you to remember what is happening. I want you to do this. He lays out these steps in a ceremonious way of every month or every week, you're going to end up doing these steps so that you can remember how God was here. You can remember that God was in this moment, how he showed up for his people. Here's what it says. It's Exodus 12, 25 through 27. It says, when you enter the land that the Lord will give you, as he promised, observe this ceremony. Now, one quick second. That's a really easy phrase for us to read today but they couldn't see into the future. They had a whole bunch more trials coming. One we just sang about, like crossing the Red Sea. They had a whole bunch of other stuff that went on in that space before they ended up in the promised land. So it's a real easy, simple sentence that we read, uh, but they were in the midst of their adversities. They were in the midst of their trials. They were where many of us find ourselves here today. So he says, after you enter the land, observe this ceremony. Here it is. When your, chi- when your children ask you, what does the ceremony mean to you? You tell them, it's the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt, spared our homes and struck down the Egyptians. And then the people bowed down and worshiped. So we have these commands. This one was to the Israelites, but we have other commands that are to us today to remember. And it's important for you. It's important for me, but I don't want you to miss this part it's important for the people around us. How you handle the current adversities and trials that you're in is important to the people around you. It says it right there, that when your kids are asking you about why you are remembering these things, why you are doing this ceremony, you have an opportunity to put God on a spotlight for them. You have an opportunity to be real honest. It was like the original parenting book, right? This is, you have an opportunity to tell your kids about how he's shown up in your life why you are the person that you are today, how he's worked in your life. And so we have this moment, and you guys have experienced this as you've walked with people who have gone through trials this way. You notice a little uptick in your own faith? Man, they're going through so much right now. And the way that their faith has been standing strong, maybe shaky, but got stronger. I feel like my faith got stronger just by being close to them. That's what he's talking about here in this space. And so it's important for you and it's important for me that we remember God in the midst of these adversities. So that's our first big takeaway is remember. And I wanna break it into two different parts, okay? Part number one is we need to remember constantly. So our emotions, our feelings are always taking in information, right? Because we're alive and we're experiencing things. So you are experiencing an emotion or a feeling about your speaker this morning, right? This is how, <laughs> this is how these things go. And so when we take time to remember, we can begin to inform our emotions. We can begin to inform our feelings. It's kind of like practicing that passage of taking every thought captive, and making it be one that's going to submit to the will of God, one that's going to glorify him. And so we remember, but we wanna remember constantly. We want to be having these things constantly happen and pop up in our lives, recalling these God circumstances. For the Israelites, this happened uh, because they followed this ceremony, right? The ceremony was a, became a rhythm of their life. There were other rhythms that they had, even collecting manna every morning in the wilderness and different things like that, where they had these ceremonies, they had these rituals, they had these rhythms that happened every single day that began to inform the feelings, that began to inform the emotions that they ran into. 
we have similar rhythms in our own life. We're doing one of them right now. As we are here, we have this rhythm of life where we are coming to church on a Sunday and we get to hear about God stories, whether that's from the person you're sitting by, whether that's from somebody out in the lobby, whether that's from a song, the person on the stage, but it's a weekly rhythm that we have of being reminded because when we're not in that rhythm, it's so easy for us to get focused in just on ourselves, to get focused in just on our circumstances. And we need to be able to have someone else that may not be in that same dark space, that may not be hitting wall after wall, be able to help encourage us up, help show us who God is. While I may not be seeing it, while I may not be feeling it at this time, just like Asaph was, it's something I still need to be poured into my life. So that's a weekly rhythm in a way that we can be remembering constantly. But then the other thing is we need to be remembering constantly and the last thing is that we need to be remembering the details. Now, if anybody in here knows a thing about me, details do not come naturally. Anything that I, any details that I keep in my life is attributed to my wife. So you can thank her for anything that I'm doing right in that category. Um, but I'm overwhelmed where I see God in the details. Asaph, he goes into the next few verses of, the, of this chapter and he starts talking about the details on how amazing God is. He talks about God's attributes and how he's powerful and he's love and he's just incredible. And he's just overwhelmed by all of the attributes of who God is. And then he shifts gears again and he talks about all these details of this event that we just sang about, the Red Sea parting. He talks about the rain and he talks about the water and he talks about the wind and the clouds and the earthquakes and all of these different things that are going on. And he does it in a beautiful poetic way like so many authors do in scripture. But here's the thing, Asaph wasn't there. This Asaph was like hundreds of years after that, that, after that happened, 300, 400 years later. So how could he go back and recall how good God was in such specific ways in this chapter? Well, I think it has to do with remembering. His mom remembered. His grandpa remembered. His great grandma remembered. His uncle remembered. And as they remembered, he was that kid somewhere along the chain who said, why are we doing this ceremony? And someone got to tell him the story of the Passover. Someone got to tell him the story of where God showed up and parted a sea that they went and walked across. It's those details that bring in so many of the memories. Now, as a person who doesn't care for the details, I love that phrase, the devil's in the details. That's like my favorite. Cause I'm like, I'm gonna stay away from the devil, right? <laughs> like that, that's what we should be doing. Um, but in my own life, it's God who I see in the details. When I take the time to sit back and remember, God just shines through the details. In our own life, in my family, we're going through a tough season. And I sit there and I want to practice what I'm preaching here today. I don't even wanna preach on this to be quite honest, but this is what God says. He says, I put this on your heart. I want you to remember me. I want you to remember me in the details. So I've had times in my life where you've probably found this. Uh, you've needed to step away from a job, maybe for financial reasons, maybe for a location reason. Maybe for personnel, whatever the reasons may be, you end up stepping away from a job, from a place that, of employment that you've been at. And all of a sudden you remember a little bit later, if you're like me in my life, I've had jobs that I've left and I look and I see, wow, God protected me from a business that closed. God protected me from <laughs> crazy management that just went nuts in this situation. One of the more powerful ones for me is that uh, I've, as I've looked back, is I've seen how God's prepared me for my current space. He's prepared me in my current job. If I even knew that I was going to be here today and have this job here at the church that I have today, I still wouldn't have prepared myself. I wouldn't have built a plan to prepare me as well as God did whether it be the circumstances he taught, the coaching that he's given me, the relationships that he's given me that's led up to this moment to be prepared for now. 
And so while our current situation is one where I don't see, feel, or see or feel God potentially, or I'm struggling with some of these emotions, I'm struggling with some of these things, at the same time, when I look back, I see that he's been protecting me, that he's been preparing me. He's kind of like a good shepherd. A few weeks ago, I ended up uh, doing something really crazy. We're at a spot in our life, we got a lot of little kids. And uh, we haven't had a night with just Emily and I in like five years. <laughs> and so we did something crazy and I decided we're gonna do a staycation. We got a hotel in Des Moines, we went to a concert, we spent too much money on food, we stayed up too, we felt crazy eating out at like midnight. It was wild experience for us. Um, and I thought this was great. Like what an amazing way, like I'm gonna be a great husband and we're gonna spend time together. I'm gonna invest in her, I'm, this is awesome. And it was, it was really, 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 really good. Um, but it had a different context when I remember, because I've done a couple other things like that as well. Uh, the whole corn maze thing. Yeah, that was kind of actually my idea. Uh, I took a day off and spent some time with my family over at the orchard. We did the corn maze and uh, it was a great time, as great as it can be. It was cold, there was walls of corn, but at the end of the day, like we spent some really, really great time as family. And that was the idea, like, let's spend some time as family. Let's not work. Let's have these moments together. But it all changed when I remembered. When I sit in the season that we're in now, I see how God had protected, how he provided, how he prepared us in so many ways, because God knew you're gonna be in a midst of adversity. You're gonna have trials coming. And I want you and your wife to be a little bit closer. He says, I want you to be able to get a little boost in your marriage because you're gonna need it to weather this next storm. And I'm like, man, God, you're good. He goes, I know you hate corn mazes, but I'm gonna put you in there with just one of your sons and you're gonna be lost in there for five minutes, have no idea and get mad, but you're gonna need that relationship. You're gonna need it to grow a little bit. He's gonna need you. You're gonna need him. He's gonna need his dad because you got a season coming and I wanna build you up. I wanna prepare you. I wanna give you a time of rest. When I didn't even know I needed a time of rest, I thought things were going great. I just wanted some time off work. And God says, I've got different plans for you. I'm a good shepherd. I'm a good father. And that's the hope that I come away with as I remember as I sit and try to remember constantly, I, I found myself in that same spot that Asaph does right after the turn in that chapter where he just sits there and praises God for his attributes. Sit there and he went from being speechless in hurt to being speechless in joy, speechless in turmoil to speechless in peace. And I found myself resonating with every aspect of that now all of those early feelings and those questions and the doubts and the emotions, they come creeping right up. As soon as I'm not remembering God constantly, as soon as I'm not remembering the details of the situations, they wanna slide right back in. They wanna be right there. But when we remember, we get an opportunity to push those away. We get an opportunity to let him decide, him to work through us in that. And so that's my encouragement to you. God is a good God. He's a good shepherd. He is protecting, he's providing, he's preparing you. In the season you may find yourself in today, maybe in a season you're gonna find yourself in in a while. I wanna show you real quick how Asaph closes this letter. I love it. He says in the last two verses in 19 and 20, he says, your path led through the sea, your way through the mighty waters, through the footprint, though your footprints we're not seen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. I love the way that the NLT says in New Living Translation, it says your road led through the sea, your pathway through the mighty waters, a pathway that no one knew was there. I don't know where you guys find yourself today. Maybe staring down that wall of whatever that bad news is, whatever your circumstances are, the unknown, of where you're headed. I wanna encourage you, take a breath. Try to remember, 
Remember where God's at. Pull people in to help you remember that he is a good shepherd, that he is providing for you, that he is protecting you, that he is preparing you for your next, and that he can provide a pathway that you might even not know is there. God, thank you so much for giving us hope in a season when, quite frankly, (laughs) we're not even real happy with you. Thank you for giving us a peace that goes beyond our circumstances, a joy that can go beyond our circumstances. And God, I just pray over everyone here that, God, that you open our eyes, that you sharpen our minds to be able to remember you in a way that we've never been able to remember you before. I pray that you help us to recall the details of the ways that you've stepped into our lives and things that seemed so unimportant at the time, but God, now we see that it was you providing a way, making a path, leading us the way that a good shepherd would lead his flock to to food, to rest, to safety. So God, thank you. Thank you for your love for us in the midst of our trials. God, I pray that whoever is in here, how they feel close to you. I pray that they feel loved by you. I pray that they go here this week remembering you. In your name we pray, amen.